Good morning, WRBC. Good morning. It is so good to see you this morning. We are glad you're here to kick off the Christmas season. Are you ready? Yeah, that's right. Amen. Are you ready? All right. All right. I think we're somewhat ready. Maybe after today, we'll really be ready. All right. So it's good to see y'all. Thank y'all for coming. We want you to stand together with us as we open up in singing. So let's praise him this morning. Sing joy to the world, and joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her King, let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the same.
so good to see you this morning. We are glad you're here. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, isn't it? I tell you, our sanctuary has been transformed, and we're so thankful for those on our decorating team who put up the decorations to have a beautiful atmosphere in the celebration of the Christmas season. If we just couldn't get them to come to each of our homes, you know, and do likewise there, it would, it would certainly help, wouldn't it? But they've done a grand job, and we appreciate that. And it's good to see you this morning, and uh, we welcome you here. If you have not already filled out your information card, we ask that everybody do it. Take it out from the bulletin, fill it out, and then when you leave at the end of the service, just drop your information card in the offering drop boxes that are at the back <laughs> by the exits. We're so glad you're here. You know, Christmas is a wonderful time, especially for Christians, uh, certainly for Christians, because those who do not know Jesus Christ are just going through a holiday and they they try to celebrate it in various ways you know sometimes with parties and covering up what's going on in their life or with alcohol or whatever but we as believers we who know jesus christ celebrate that god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life so this is a grand time of year and we would be reminded there's so many in our world that do not know jesus christ and we who know him are to help make him known. And so just be mindful of that, especially during this holiday season, to tell somebody why we celebrate Christmas. It's because of Jesus. Glad you're here. Let me lead us in prayer this morning. Father God, we are thankful to you that you loved us, that on the first Christmas you sent Jesus so that we could know God and so that we could have our sins forgiven through Christ and live everlasting with you. And so we celebrate you, not just this time of the year, but all year through, because you're worthy of our praise. I thank you for each one that have here, that have come into your house to celebrate you, to worship your name. And I pray that our worship would be pleasing to you, because you're our audience. You're the one that we sing for. You're the one that we gather for. You're the one that we praise. And so we just pray that it would be acceptable to you. We pray for our nation. We pray for our world. So many do not know you. So many do not know why we sing, why we celebrate, why we gather for worship. It's because of you. May they see it through us. It's in the wonderful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together. Yes. 
this morning. Amen. <laughs> Gloria images his day. Oh, absolutely. We're going to continue to praise him. Feel free to clap along with us as we praise his name together. Let's celebrate.
and my song with the angels. Tell everyone the news that you came as a child beside us in our struggles. Now we come lifting high the name that's like no I'd like to read a passage out of Luke chapter 1. This is our scripture for today. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. The scripture says this. In the time of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of the Lord, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well along in years. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty, and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of the incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of the incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, 
and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel he will bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but he remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. And after this, his wife, Elizabeth, became pregnant, and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. saying a word. I'm talking complete silence. God was for over 400 years. The muteness from the creator of the universe. The one who said that Earth is but a footstool to him was about to break his silence. shall name him John. A son? You will have great joy, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He will turn many to the Lord their God. He will come with the power of Elijah. Elijah. He will prepare the people for the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children. But, but I'm an old man. My wife. I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. And it was he who sent me to give you this good news. 
You will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. For what he has spoke will surely be fulfilled. begins, the ritual becomes radiant, and the faithful become fathers. When God speaks, the heavens rise and the earth bows. Hope grows where hurt was rooted. Time becomes eternity, and he leads us to holy ground that was once hollow. Yes, my friends, God is just getting started. I'd like you to take your outline. We're looking at the call of Christmas. Angels. When you hear the word angels, I suspect a lot of things come through your mind. A lot of uh, maybe TV shows, a lot of maybe books you have read. But if you conduct a Google search on angel encounters, it will pull up hundreds upon hundreds and hundreds of incidences and results of people reporting encounters with angels. Angels in just about every country and in just about every period of history. Have you ever encountered an angel? Think about Hebrews 13, verse 2, which says, Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Billy Graham, of course, many years ago, wrote a book entitled Angels, God's Secret Agents. And in the book, he writes this, I believe in angels because the Bible says that there are angels. And I believe the Bible to be the true word of God. The Bible testifies that God has provided assistance for us in our spiritual conflicts. We're not alone in this world. In nearly 300 different places, the Bible teaches that God has countless angels at his command. Furthermore, God has commissioned these angels to aid his children in their struggles against Satan. If the activities of the devil and the demons seem to be intensifying in these days, as I believe they are, should not the incredibly greater supernatural powers of God's holy angels be even more indelibly impressed upon the minds of the people of faith? After all, references to the holy angels in the Bible far outnumber the references to Satan and his subordinate demons. If you are a believer, expect mighty angels to accompany you in your life experiences. I also believe in angels, Dr. Graham writes, because I have sensed their presence in my life on special occasions. In the four Sundays leading up to Christmas and concluding on Christmas morning. We're going to be talking about four characters in the Bible that make up the Christmas story. And each of these four characters in the Bible had an angel encounter. And the encounter with the angel was a part of the call of Christmas 
to them to be a part of the Christmas story, what we call the Christmas story. So we are calling this series, these four Sundays leading up to Christmas, the call of Christmas. And we're going to talk about the call of Christmas on Zechariah that we'll talk about this morning, the call of Christmas to Mary, the call of Christmas to Joseph, and the call of Christmas to the shepherds. In this passage of the scripture that I read just a moment ago from Luke chapter 1, we're told about Zechariah. Zechariah was a priest, and he received the call of Christmas from the angel Gabriel to prepare. Now you see, God, as a part of his sovereign plan of sending the Messiah to the earth, to the world, to be the Savior, wanted to send someone to herald his coming or to prepare the way for the Messiah's coming. And so God chose this priest named Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth to have a son, and they would name the son John, or as we know him as John the Baptist, and he would prepare the way for the Messiah. In uh, our study on Wednesday night, we've been going through the book of Mark, and those of you that have been following the study on Wednesday nights, you know that a couple of weeks ago we were in chapter 1, where Mark in chapter 1 talks about John the Baptist and how he was a preparer, the preparer of the coming of the Messiah. And that was a very important role in the call of Christmas. Now, when we think of the Christmas story, and when we think of maybe the beginning of the Christmas story, really the Christmas story goes all the way back in the Old Testament with the prophets. But when we think of it from the New Testament perspective, most of us think as the beginning of the Christmas story when the angel came to Mary and told Mary that she would have a son, and that son would be Jesus, and we'll talk about that uh, next Sunday. But actually, the Christmas story begins with Zechariah, the call to prepare. But how many of you have little Zechariah statues uh, out in your front yard or in a, a set? We don't do that. We don't have Zechariah statues or actually put him too much in the, uh, the Christmas story, but he was really a very important part of the call of Christmas, and that was the call to prepare. So let's talk about it a little bit this morning. Notice in your outline that God sovereignly works in our lives for his purposes. God sovereignly works in our life for his purposes. He did then, and he does now also. Let me just kind of call your attention to how he worked then, how he worked in Zechariah's life for his purposes. Luke 1, verse 8 and 9 says, Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty, and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and to burn incense. Zechariah was a priest, and a priest would spend 50 weeks of the year in his hometown serving in the local synagogue. You remember how we talked in Mark that the, the temple was in Jerusalem, but there were many synagogues in towns throughout Israel, much like we have you know, churches throughout towns uh, in pla various places. They were synagogues throughout Israel, and the priest that lived in that town would serve for 50 weeks in that local synagogue carrying out the duties of the priest and as the worshipers came. But for two weeks of every year, he would go along with his priestly divisions. The, the, the priesthood was, was divided into various divisions, and each division was made up of hundreds and hundreds, sometimes even thousands of priests. But for two weeks out of the year, the priest would go up to Jerusalem with all the other priests in their division to serve at the temple in Jerusalem, the various activities involved in carrying on the functions and the worshiping of the people at the temple. Now, one of the highest privileges, one of the highest and most holy duties and honors that a priest could receive is that when his division went to Jerusalem for two weeks out of the year to serve the temple there, one of the highest things that could happen to him 
was for him to be chosen to go into the holy place and to offer incense before the Lord. Now, there were so many priests, like I said, there were so many priests in each division that most priests never were chosen to go into the holy place. And for those who were chosen, it was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Well, the Scripture says that the choosing of this priest was uh, 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 position was by lot. Kind of like we would say you put your name in a hat and draw out you know, one from the hat. But the problem is there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of priest names in the hat that were drawn. But on this time, this occasion, Zachariah's name was drawn. It was not by luck. It was not by chance, but it was by the sovereign working of God that, that Zechariah was chosen. And then look down in uh, verse 20 of Luke chapter 1. It says, when the angel appeared to him, he said, All of my words will come true just as I've said at the proper time. That's part of the sovereign working of God. God's words take place and they come true at the proper time, at the proper place. So God was sovereignly at work in the life of Zechariah at the first Christmas and God is sovereignly at work today in your life. You may not see how he's working, but he's sovereignly working in circumstances. He's sovereignly working through prayers, some of your prayers, some of the prayers of other people. God is sovereignly working for his purposes. Now, the second thing I want you to see is that we are prepared for God's use by faithfulness to God. We are prepared for God's use, or we are made ready for God's use by faithfulness or being faithful to God. Look uh, in Luke 1, verse 6, how Zechariah was faithful. We want to talk about how he was faithful to God. Luke 1, 6 says, Both of them, Zechariah and Elizabeth, were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive. And they both were very old. But the angel said to Zechariah, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you're to call him John. Zechariah and Elizabeth were remarkably faithful to God. And as you think about just how they lived, it, it was really remarkable because they lived in a time of terrible unfaithfulness to God. You know, in some ways, we are in a terrible time of unfaithfulness to God. There's so many in our world today, even some that name the name of Christ, that are not living for Jesus Christ. They're living very unfaithful, very disobedient lives to God. But Zechariah and Elizabeth were living lives of faithfulness to God. And just think about this. In the video, it talked about, you know, when we come to Luke, it's at the beginning of what we call the New Testament time. And before that was the Old Testament. But there was, what, over 400 years from the Old Testament to where we pick it up in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John to what's taking place. And God in the Old Testament, through his prophets, had spoken of a coming Messiah, that he would send the Messiah, the Redeemer, the Savior to the world. But when Zechariah is going into the temple... It's been over 400 years. God's been silent. No prophets have spoken. They haven't heard from God, and the Messiah hasn't come. But when Zechariah goes into the temple, just as he did back in his local synagogue, but when he comes to the temple of Jerusalem, he's offering the incense, what represents the, pe the prayers of the people, and his prayer is that God would fulfill his word, that God would send the Messiah to be the Savior, to the Redeemer. The, the priest had been doing this for over 400 years, and the whole time, God had been silent. How are you on your faithfulness when God is silent? When you pray for something, 
and it doesn't seem like God is even there, much less doing anything. Many of us would give, after, give up after four days of praying and not seeing results, or four hours, or maybe even four minutes. But the people had been praying for, for 400 years, and Zechariah had been praying and praying, and had been seeing all the prayers of the people, and nothing was happening. But not only that, the Scripture tells us that Zechariah had been praying for something else. He had been praying for a child. He had been praying for a son. And the scripture says that it, it seemed like an impossible prayer because Elizabeth, his wife, was barren. She could not have children. And not only that, he was very old, and the scripture says, and she was well advanced in years. That was being kind to the lady, wasn't it? Zechariah was very old, but she was well advanced in years. So, not only if she could have children, not only if she wasn't barren, she was beyond the childbearing age. So it seemed totally impossible. So, but here is Zechariah praying for the two great things on his heart that he would be able to have a child, he and Elizabeth, and that the Messiah would come. And here the angel comes to Zechariah and says, Zechariah, I'm going to answer your prayers. They have been heard. The two greatest desires of your heart are going to be answered in one great event. You'll have a son. You'll name him John. And that son will be the forerunner of the Messiah, the one that the priest, and the people have been praying for over 400 years. The one who you have been faithfully praying for, every time you went into the synagogue, you prayed that God would send the Messiah. Those two prayers are going to be answered in one grand event. So on the inside of your outline, I put this very important note. Don't let circumstances dictate to you what you believe God can do. Or can't do. Don't let circumstances dictate to you what you believe God can do or He can't do. I mean, if you looked at the circumstances, Messiah hadn't been here in 400 years. No, the prophets are not even talking. God's not saying anything. I guess He's not coming. Elizabeth is not only barren; she is well advanced in years. <laughs> that looks impossible. But don't allow circumstances to dictate to you what God can do. God is sovereign over circumstances. And so on your outline, a little bit later in the passage that I read from Luke chapter 1 down in verse 36 and 37, this is when Elizabeth meets up with Mary. Mary, you know, is con conceives Jesus, has the baby Jesus in her womb, and Mary, uh, Mary and Elizabeth are talking, and here Mary says, even Elizabeth, your relative, uh, the angel said to Mary, your relative is going to have a child in her old age, and she, who was said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. That's one of the most wonderful passages in the Bible. Nothing is impossible. There are a lot of things that are impossible with man. But God's not man. He's God. Jesus became a man, but he's fully God. But God is God, and God does that which is impossible. You see, when we look at circumstances, and the circumstances sin, seem to say to us, well, God can't do this, God can't move, God can't work, things are out of control, we're not to say, well, I, I guess it can't, God can't, because you know, things, the circumstances say this. We are still to be faithful to God. And as we're faithful, it prepares us for God working in our life. Look at this passage, Matthew 25, verse 23. Jesus was telling a parable, and he was teaching us and those that were listening about the, the importance of being faithful to God. And in Matthew 25, verse 23, he was telling about this master who owned various servants, and one servant was 
faithful to God and you said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. You see, when we are faithful to God, we're preparing ourselves to experience more of God and to be used in mighty ways by God. Zechariah was faithful, and that was a call in his life to prepare. And then third on your outline, there's always plenty of evidence to believe God. There's always plenty of evidence to believe God. Luke 1, verse 12, and verse 18 and 19, says when Zechariah saw the angel, he was startled, and he was gripped with fear. I mean, wouldn't you, if, a, if an angel showed up, Zechariah knew, knew enough of the Old Testament when angels appeared that it meant your life was about to drastically and dramatically change, you know. So here this angel shows up. He's startled. He is afraid. And Zachari he, the angel told him, said, Elizabeth's going to come pre be, be pregnant, and she's going to have a son. You're going to name him John. And Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. And the angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I've been sent to you to speak to you and to tell you this good news. I mean, I mean, this thing, I mean the angel says, okay, Zechariah, God's heard your prayers. Elizabeth's going to be pregnant. She's going to have a son. Now, the angel is standing right in front of him. And Zechariah says, how can I be sure of this? I mean, an angel is standing in front of him, you know. I mean, if an angel stands in front of you, you know, that is, that's a pretty good evidence right there. There's an angel standing here. And the angel said, just to let you know, I stand in the presence of God. And God has sent me with this word for you. So you want evidence? I'm right here in front of you. Now let's just think about this a minute. It's not wrong to want evidence to believe in God. In fact, God doesn't call us to blind faith. You know, a lot of times uh, unbelievers will say, those Christians, they just have blind faith. No, well, we don't have blind We have faith. You know, in Hebrews it says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Belief is... The faith is the substance upon which we stand. It is reason that we believe. And God gives reason for us to believe him. So it is not wrong to want evidence to believe. What is wrong is to want or demand more evidence than God has provided us. Why is it wrong to want more evidence to believe in God than the evidence he's provided? Well, if he's God, and he is, and he says, you're to believe upon me, he will give us all the evidence we need to believe. The problem is, many times we don't want to believe the evidence God has given. And so we want to put it off on God and say, you had not given me enough evidence. How can I know this is true? Remember Jesus in talking to some of the unbelievers of his day who kept saying you need to show us a miracle you need to do more you need to give me more evidence he said a wicked and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign it's a wicked and adulterous people unfaithful people who want more evidence to believe than they have already received because they're saying i don't believe what god's already given god gives all that we need to believe the question is will we believe or will we be unfaithful? Will we be, will we be, be unbelieving and untrusting in God? I mean, just think about evidence that God, this is kind of just a side note, evidence that God has given us to believe in him. He's given creation. In the book of Romans, it said, the things that have been made are so clear and plain as to give testimony of the existence of God is so clear just by looking at creation that man is without excuse for saying I had no way of knowing there was a God. So you can know there's a God just by saying look at creation there had to be a creator. He says but what man says is 
I don't want to believe that. I believe in evolution. I believe everything just evolved with the Big Bang rather than God. He said, it is so crazy to think that everything got here just on its own by chance, by accident, that man has no excuse. He can't say, I had no way of knowing. There's plenty of evidence. But man don't want to believe the evidence there is. And then, of course, we have the Word of God. It is the Word of God that is evidence to believe God. There is the life of Jesus Christ, his perfect life, his sinless life, his death upon the cross. If you don't believe his death, then how about the resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the evidence of that? You say, well, I don't believe. It, 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 it's, it's never wrong to want evidence, but it's wrong to want more evidence to believe than that which God has given. And God has given plenty of evidence to believe him. He gave plenty of evidence to Zechariah. <laughs> the angel was standing right in front of him. But Zechariah says, how can I know that this is true? And God, through the angel, said, you'll be silent. You'll not speak in. You want some evidence? There you, there you go. I'll give you a little bit more. You won't speak. But Zechariah, you said, well, here was Zechariah. I thought you said he was a faithful man. He was a righteous man. He was a blameless man. And yet in this moment, he did not believe God. He fell in his belief. Well, Zechariah was blameless in his ways, meaning that the pattern of his life was seeking after God. But he, he was still a man. He was not a perfect man. There's not a whole lot of those around. He was not perfect. And in the moment, he fell into doubt and did not believe the word of the Lord that came to him, just like us. Many times we believe, but we ask God to help us in our unbelief because there are moments in our struggle, sometimes that we struggle to believe God. But what do you do when you fail in your belief? When God, maybe because of circumstance, you've been looking at the circumstance, the way things appear, and then God says this or God says, trust me in this, and you don't. What do you do? Well, you don't stay stuck in your unbelief. You, you turn back to God and believe. I mean, think about, uh, think about Peter. You know, he was a follower, a disciple of Jesus, and there came a time when the circumstances were tough, when the heat was on, right after the crucifixion of Jesus, and people came and said, aren't you connected with the Jesus, the one who's just being crucified and being, has been arrested and about to be crucified? And he, oh, I don't know who you're talking about. He fell in unbelief, but what did he do after that? He came back to the Lord. He didn't stay in his unbelief. He was greatly used of God. What did Zechariah do? Zechariah, God made him speechless, but then if you read on to the rest of the story, when the little baby boy was born, they were said, okay, we need to give him names. And everybody says, well, you know, of course, we named him after the father, so we're going to name him Zechariah II. Uh, or how about Zechariah Jr.? We, let's name him that. And Zechariah's going, no, 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 and he can't talk. He's going, no, 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 And he goes, give me something to write on. And they go, okay, we're going to name him Zechariah Jr. And they go, he's going, no, no, no. And he writes and he calls him John. Where did he get that from? You remember what Gabriel said when he's born? You will name him John. Don't you think Zechariah had done a lot of thinking and very little talking <laughs> when he couldn't speak? He probably did a lot of more praying too, didn't he? And he said, I've got to trust God. You know, this Christmas season, there's a lot of stuff going on. Sometimes we just need to be still and quiet before the Lord. Maybe not do a lot of talking. A lot, of, a lot of telling what we want, you know, what we're going to do, but just a lot of stillness before God. Sometimes God strikes us and makes us be still, but he always calls us to be still and know that he is God. So in the call of Christmas to you, just be still and allow God to prepare you for what he's wanting to do in your life. There's always plenty of evidence to believe in God if you'll trust him and obey him. And then number four, I love this, because of Christmas, God wants to show us favor and take away our shame. Because of Christmas, God wants to show us favor and he wants to take away our shame. Again, Luke 1, verse 24. After this, Zechariah's wife Elizabeth became pregnant. And for five months, she remained in seclusion. 
The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor, and he's taken away my disgrace from among the people. You know, in Old Testament days and in Zechariah's day, for a married woman not to be able to have children was a, a disgraceful thing. It was, it was seen by m- most of the people as a judgment of God as a disgrace, as a shame brought upon the person because possibly because of some sin or unfaithfulness or disobedience in that person's life. And so Zechariah and Elizabeth experienced this weight of shame for years and years and years upon their life because of their not being able to have children. But when the call of Christmas came to Zechariah and Elizabeth, the favor of God shone upon them, and she became pregnant. She gave birth to a son, and the shame was lifted. You see, the call of Christmas today is to trust God, prepare our hearts for Him, and when we do, the favor of God is upon us. And the shame of our sin, the shame of our lostness is removed. It's always the message of Christmas. The favor of God. I mean, just look on your outline. I put down Luke chapter 2, verse 14. When the angels appeared to the shepherds we're going to talk about on Christmas morning, the angel said, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those who upon whom his favor rests. The Christmas call shows that God wants us to experience his favor. He wants us to experience forgiveness. He wants us to experience the cleansing that removes the shame of sin. Do you know Jesus Christ? You know, we said at the beginning, Christmas is, is the most wonderful time for Christians. Because we know the Christ of Christmas. Do you know Jesus Christ? Have you believed upon him? There's more than enough evidence to believe. The question is, will you believe? Will you trust him? Will you follow him as your Lord and Savior? Would you bow your heads this morning? Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for Christmas. We thank you that the call of Christmas still continues. It continues today. For some here today have never responded. Give them the faith, give them the trust, give them the courage to believe upon you, to be saved. We thank you for that great love that makes salvation possible. In the wonderful name of Jesus we pray, amen. Stand with me as we sing. He who was before there was light Walked across the pages of time He who made every living thing Behold Him He who heard humanity's cry Left His throne to wake as a child He became like the least of us. Behold him, Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the roaring lion. Oh, be still and behold him. and saints 
He's the Lord God Almighty. Worthy, worthy, worthy to receive all praise. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. you'll do that this Christmas. You'll be still and you'll behold Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior. Prepare him room in your life. Glad you're here this morning. So many things going along in the hospitals, uh, the uh, holiday season. We're trying to help you experience God and the significance of Christmas in many different ways, in a variety of ways. One way we do that is by taking a special offering at the Christmas time called the Lottie Moon Christmas Offering. This offering, all the monies that you give to this offering that are above your normal tithes and offerings go to help support missionaries in other countries tell people about Jesus. We said that people need the Lord. And there are many ways we can tell, but one important way is to help our missionaries share the gospel around the world. So we have a little short video that we want to show for you now that it helps explain a little bit more about the Lottie Moon Christmas offering and why it's so important. So you'll be seated for just a moment. There's so much lostness in the world. There's so much the feeling of hopelessness and helplessness in the world. The answer for them is Christ. I was born in Malaysia in 1947. My family were idol worshippers. It was my duty, even though I was a boy, to serve the gods. And so without fail, every evening before we have our dinner, I would put jars in front of the idols. It was a big deal because we have idols for everything. My high school teacher invited me to an evangelistic meeting. That was the first time I heard about Christ. I heard that I was a sinner, and coming from my background, I felt that I was pretty good, you know. And then one night, I believe it was the prompting of the Holy Spirit, a thought came to my mind, and uh, which said to me, if this God is true, the greatest sin in my life would be to deny that. That really got hold of me. And uh, the Lord convicted me of my sin. I went to all my, the idols and I said, this is the last time that I'm going to serve you. I have found the true God. And that was it. <laughs> I felt called to the ministry. I studied at uh, Hong Kong Baptist Seminary, which is 
also started by Southern Baptists, funded by Southern Baptists, and staffed by Southern Baptists. Had it not been for the Lottie Moon offering, my life would have turned in a totally different direction. It's a gift that keeps on giving through the lives of people that are touched through the generosity of Southern Baptists. And I'm one of them, by the grace of God. ventriloquist tell you that right now <laughs> but this doll is here for a reason I got this doll when I was 17 um, you know I'm not up here about this doll I'm up here about the story of Lottie Moon you know she gave her life and when she first started out just from a wealthy family uh, going to college and her friends invited her to go hear the word Anyway, y'all, she said to the Lord, and she uh, wanted to get on the mission field. And you got to remember, that's a God thing then, because her being single and her being a woman, she was engaged at one time, but he just didn't believe like she did. <coughs> Excuse me. She spent 40 years, y'all, over in China. She was trying to get help for people to come over there to help her out. And it's like anything else. You know, if you don't feel led, then you don't go. And a lot of them, they just didn't have the money. The first uh, thing that was sent to Lottie Moon, they finally said, hey, we've got people that's going to come. The salary was uh, $3,000. Now we support it's $4.5 And that goes all the missionaries, and that's from all of our uh, Baptist churches. And I, I think about her being over there, and, and at first they didn't like her. She made cookies, and the kids thought she was the devil. But anyway, you know, it only takes one to have a bite of cookies. She said, hey, I'm, li I'm still living. So anyway, then they all decided, and they really liked her. But anyway... Y'all, our goal this year, it's very reasonable. It's the year 2022. I know we can reach it. I know we can go above it. The reason I have this doll up here, you think about Christmas. Y'all, you probably don't know what you got last year. We buy, we buy, we buy, we buy. Y'all, this is for eternity. This is for eternity. When you put money in gifts and it goes over there, it's to help those missionaries to get out and say, hey, God loves you. God loves you. So I want y'all to really think about that. Uh, <clears throat> in our great commission, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age so y'all here's the envelopes they're out there and I know that y'all are going to be just generous and I'm excited thank you so much Right, we're going to sing our closing chorus. If you'll stand with us. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven.
Thanks for being here this morning. We hope to see you Wednesday night.